Hey, welcome to The Conversation. My name is Kyle, and I'm coming to you from the First Colony Church of Christ in Sugarland, Texas. I'm glad that you're here, and I am glad that we are together. We are in a teaching series here on The Conversation called Margin. Margin. Margin is the space where faith grows. It's the space where faith grows. It's the embracing of our own limits and understanding that those limits are part of our design, how, how we are created. We're going to talk about that today, actually. Our limits are part of our creation, and embracing those limits allows us to see the miraculous, beautiful, magnificent, salvific work of God in our lives through Jesus Christ. You know, the first week of this teaching series, we talked about what margin is and why we need it. The second week we talked about time and the need for us to adopt God's definition of time. Time's sacred. We only have a limited amount. We need to make sure that we use it for holy things. And last week we talked about margin in family units and in family spaces. You do not have to have had to watch any of the pre of the three previous conversations for today, but you can catch all those on demand if you want. Today, we're going to end this series with what I think is uh, uh, probably uh, one of the the more pressing needs uh, in the conversation about margin. And today, we're going to talk about the need for moral margin. Moral margin. It's distance. Moral margin is the distance between you and temptation. Moral margin is the distance between you. It's between the distance between me and temptation. The distance between you and temptation. We're going to talk about that through a couple of passages in the New Testament. And I hope that you embrace this. I hope that you find this idea in your life extremely applicable, especially as we are tempted. Now, that's critical. So we're going to talk a little bit about sin today. And we're going to talk about the need to avoid those temptations that lead us in bad places and in bad spaces. But first, we need to talk about, not about that stuff, we need to talk about why we were created in the first place. Now, I'm sure that you are familiar with Genesis chapter 1, and you're familiar, we've actually talked about that quite a bit on the conversation, but you're familiar with this, the 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 impetus for our creation. God wanted to create humans in his image, right? You remember that from Genesis chapter one, that you and I are created in the image of God. We bear the image of God in the world and relationships in our careers and our neighborhoods. We are the visible manifestation of God to people in our environment. That's kind of what we're created for. Now that doesn't mean that we're created to be perfect. You know that? My goodness, you know that. I know that. I am not perfect. You're not perfect. We're not created to be perfect. It doesn't mean that. But it means that As we follow Jesus and are empowered by the presence of God in our life, that we become image bearers. Image bearer, that phrase was actually used in other literature in the same time as the Old Testament was written in other other empires. And what it meant was that the person who was an image bearer looked and acted like a king. In fact, in Egypt, the only person that could be an image bearer was the Pharaoh himself. So what's kind of cool about that language is that that the the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament adopted that phrase and said, you know what, everyone is royalty in the economy of God. You and I are royalty. In fact, Paul picks up on that in Galatians when he says, we're all sons of God. We're all, we're all his children. Like we, there, there is no distinction here. So this idea of being created in the image of God, of, of being royalty on the planet, of, of representing God, of being the visible manifestation of God to people that we know is critical to understand the need and the effects of moral margin. Right, so we need to understand why we we were created. So to do that, we're gonna we're gonna go to James. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to James chapter one. By the way, I, I seem to always forget this. Right, I'm sorry about that. But we got some chats. We have some. Uh, there's a there's a chat box there where you are, uh, where you're watching the conversation. And I want to invite you to log on and say hi in our chat box. 
to our moderators. They're, they're, they're waiting to get to know you. They want to get to know you. If you've got some questions about the conversation or if you have some questions about the First Colony Church of Christ, they're going to answer those for you. And if they can't, they're going to make sure that they can get the answers for you. And you know what? If you got a question for me, you can send it to them and they generally send it to me. Or you can just email me if you want, kyles at firstcolonychurch.org. You can send the email straight to me and we'll we'll hammer it out there. But go ahead and log on to the chat. Say hi. Uh, tell everybody where you're from and, uh, and just uh, be receive the, the blessing of community even in this uh, technological space. All right. So log in and say hi. We want to get to know you. So back to the New Testament. Turn to James chapter one. Now, now James, the, the letter of James has often been called the Proverbs of the New Testament, right? The Old Testament book of Proverbs are these supercharged sayings of common sense, but they're filled with the, the, the spirit of God. They're in the inspired words of God. And so it's not just common sense when you read Proverbs, it's how the Lord expects us to function in the world. Well, James kind of feels that way, especially written by the half-brother of Jesus. So listening to, to the writings of James gives us, to me, I think it's really, it's really kind of neat. It gives us an insight into the family of, of Jesus and James. So when we read this, I want you to hear this not just as ancient scripture, as uh, sentences, as things to adopt in your life, but I want you to hear it as someone who lived beside Jesus and then who initially did not accept that Jesus was the Son of God, but came to believe in him and became one of the critical leaders in the early church in Acts. So all of James is that way. You should read all of James that way, but especially right here in the first chapter. I want you to, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna read something about our creation on our journey to understand the need and the necessity and how to have moral margin in our life. So here we are. Listen to this. This is James chapter 1, verse 18. He, the Father, God is actually called the Father in the previous verse. The Father chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. He chose us. It was his will. Listen to that again. It was his will to, it was his will to give us birth through the word of truth. That is a, a fantastic phrase in the New Testament. In fact, if you're just running through various translations, that, that Greek word is translated, it's called bulamai, and that word is translated a lot of different ways. In, in the New English translation, it's called by his sovereign plan. But the NIV, it says he chose to give us birth. I think it softens that a little bit. Uh, the New American Standard Bible says that in the exercise of his will, which I, I really like, in the New Revised Standard Version says that in fulfillment of his own purpose. You know, generally when you read scripture and you read various English translations, you find a lot of similarities. But that word is so power packed that our English translators sometimes have, have trouble, have trouble translating it because what it does is it affects theology. It affects our theology. So like when you read the NIV and you see that it, it says that he chose, well, there's a reason it says that. I'm going to tell you that in just a minute. But in other translations that are a little more comfortable with the fact that out of God's good pleasure, he, cho he, he, he formed us, he gave birth to us through the word of truth. There is something, there is something unbelievable about that, about that statement that he chose to give us birth. It was his pleasure. It was by his goodwill. Again, the new revised standard version says in fulfillment of his own purpose, this brought him pleasure. This is something that he wanted to do. And when God wants to do something, it happens, right? When he wants to do something, it is, it, it absolutely happens. So here, in fulfillment of his purpose, by his own will, for his own good pleasure, he gave us birth through the word of truth. You and I, it, it pleased God to create us, but not just to create. In other words, it, it's not enough that he just had a plan or that he formulated this idea or he had a purpose or he had a will or he had a will to do this. 
It was that he had a will to do it. There was an action. It wasn't just a thought. There was an action. And according to his good will, his good pleasure, he gave us birth through the word of truth. I want you to think about that for, for just a quick second. This is the reason you were created. It's exactly compatible with Genesis 1 and being created in the image of God. We have been given birth because God wanted this to happen. We've been given birth through the word of truth. There's all kinds of stuff to unpack there, right? So not only not only the, uh, the reason for our creation, but the effect of it. It wasn't that we were just created to be. We were created to be born through the word of truth. What, what, what is the word of truth? Well, that the word word actually finds its origin in the gospel stories in the parables of the seed. Remember that? The, the, the seed is the word and, and it, uh, sometimes the birds take it. Sometimes it grows up on it's thrown on the path sometimes it grows up among weeds but the but but sometimes it has this miraculous yield right so that word word finds its origin in that parable and again James right the half brother of Jesus understands something about this word he heard his he heard his brother say this he heard this phrase so when he writes the word of truth he's saying something very deliberate here what he's saying is that We are meant to pursue truth. But but even more than that, what he's saying is that there is truth. There is a truth. Not the truth. There is a truth. Truth is under assault right now in our culture. It's been hijacked by a lot of people and a lot of interests that truth is something very wishy-washy and it can be changed, it can be camouflaged, it can, it can, it can be a chameleon, it, 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 it looks different, it, it, it hides until we decide to bring it out, but then when we bring it out, it's our truth, it's not the truth. You've heard, you've heard all of this. I don't have to, to go over that here. What James is saying is that the deliberate act of God was to give us birth into truth. And by using the word, word here, he's saying that you can find this truth in scripture. It's a little meta, right? It's a little meta because he's writing scripture. He doesn't know it at the time, but he's writing scripture. But he's saying that these words in in the Bible, the the, the words of Jesus' followers adequately describe and detail the truth. John says it later in 1 John chapter 1 that he's seen it, he's heard it, he's touched it. This is the person. This is the truth and I can testify that he's real because I've been around him. So the the example and the teaching of Jesus, not just in the Gospels, but in the rest of the New Testament, give us, point us in the right direction for truth. And you know what this means? That means that, that our feelings are secondary to truth. Our emotions are secondary to truth. Our opinions are secondary to truth. In fact, Jesus says this in, in the Gospel of Mark. He also says it in the Gospel of Luke that following him means that we, we have to crucify ourselves every day. In other words, we put to death our own selves. We put to death our opinions. We put to death our feelings, our emotions. Following Jesus while it can be an emotional experience, is not primarily an emotional experience. We follow Jesus because he's the truth, whether whether we agree with it or not. What's the point of all that, right? So being born in the word of truth means that we are born as image bearers, adequately saying that the original creation, right? Genesis Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is the idea of God for humanity. And everything after that, after the fall of Adam and Eve and after their sin, everything got a little wonky. And through the grace and mercy of Jesus, through the power of his resurrection, we can, in a world of difficulty, 
live as image bearers because it was God's will for us to do that. It was God's will for you to do that. Now, let's stop there. You know all this. Where's the idea of moral margin here? Well, for that, we have to go back up a little bit in James chapter 1. I wanted to give you the good stuff first because it's going to frame how we talk about moral margin. So let's go all the way up to James chapter 1, verse 12. Listen to this. Blessed is the man, blessed is the person, who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, we have to stop there because if we're, if we're not careful, we're going to interpret James' teaching here as, as, our, as, as our behavior warrants a reward, right? We know that's not true. It's the grace of Jesus that allows us to be saved. Paul writes that in Ephesians 2. It's by the grace of God through faith that you've been saved, not from your works, not from the stuff you do, so you can't boast about it. It's not in your corner. You don't, you don't have that in your toolbox. So right here, it's, it's, it's important to stop and say, James is not teaching that, that if we do A, we will get B. He's saying that there's a consequence of A, but it's not a reward. Let's keep going. Verse 13. But when tempted, actually, I think that word should be tested, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. So I'm going to read it that way. Verse 13. When tested, no one should say, God's tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So verse 12 talks about testing, right? It talks about testing. Blessed is the person who perseveres under testing. All of life is a test. When have you not been tested this week? Testing is an absolute part of our existence and following of Jesus. This is an, this is an absolute fact. Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial under testing. It's going to happen. In the end, if you persevere, now what does that mean to persevere? Well, we have to go to verse 13 for that. You receive a crown. So, so, so what does that mean to persevere, right? So verse 13 says this, so when you're tested, right? Why am I, why am I reading it that way? Well, the word for tempting and testing is actually the same word. It just depends on context. And a lot of scholars have said that verse 12 belongs to the previous verses. But there are just as many that are now saying that verse 12 belongs to the following verses. So we're going to treat it that way, that verse 12 through verse 18 is a unit. And when you see it that way, you understand the teaching of James. We highlight and pull out verse 13 for a lot of things. But I think it has to be read and taught in context. So when tested, verse 13, no one should say God is tempting me. In other words, the result of the test, the point of the test is to not tempt you. So if you endure, if you persevere under testing, what that means is you have refused to give in to the temptations that come along with the testing. And what does that mean? Well, in the context of James, it means that when when you're tested, because it's, it's hard following Jesus, there, there are beautiful moments, but there are also some really tough moments when you realize the friction of what it means to follow Jesus. What James is saying here is that those moments in, in extreme testing will tempt you to abandon your faith, to exalt yourself, to reclaim your opinions, to climb off of the cross that you crawled on that morning when you woke up, when you agreed to crucify yourself, to following Jesus. It says, I'm done with the crucifixion of my wants and my opinions. So there's victory in that, right? That's the, that's the idea of the crown. When you've endured, when you've persevered, you receive a crown. This crown wasn't necessarily a crown that a king or a queen would wear. It's a, it's a, it's a, a laurel crown. It's a crown that was given to uh, 
to victors in athletic competitions. That's what you got. You didn't get a gold medal. You got a, a laurel crown from that. That's the point here. You've, you've achieved something when you have not succumbed to the temptation. Now, what's kind of interesting here is how James describes this temptation, right? He says each one, God, God can't be tempted. God's not tempting me. That's not the point of the test. The point of the test is not for you to be tempted. It's for you to walk into your created purpose, which means that you were given birth through the word of truth. That's the point of the testing. Discipline in the book of Hebrews said that discipline, this is Hebrews, uh, the end of the, the book of Hebrews says that, that our God disciplines us so that we can receive a feast, a harvest of righteousness in the end. Right? So that's, this is James' way of saying the same thing. God is not tempting us in tests. This is the way that we are born into the word of truth. But listen to verse 14. But listen, I'm sorry, the end of verse 13. For God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted. Now listen to verse 14. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So we have, we have two alternate paths here. We have, a, we have a path of victory, of perseverance, of achieving something. And then over here, the other path, the alternate path, is the path of death. The path of extreme consequences and spiritual death. But in the middle of that, we find something really interesting, that, that we're tempted by our, by our own evil desires. Now, that's a really tricky phrase there, right? That's a really tricky phrase. Because what this kind of says here is that, actually, if we, if, we, if we read this in isolation of verse, verse 18, which is why I started with verse 18, if we read it in isolation of verse 18, it's going to sound like that we have some mystical power that we're so alone in our temptation. We have these evil desires, and these evil desires conflict with our created purpose, but, but, but they're sort of out there. And, and, and when we're tempted, we feel extremely isolated. And James kind of sounds that way, right? It, it kind of reads that way, but it doesn't read that way if you begin with verse 18, that, there, that God purposefully wanted you to live so you can experience the life of being birthed into and through the word of truth. There is a reason you're alive. So even in your temptation, you're not alone. But the, the, the bigger part of this, and it's, it may, might be a little too theological for this setting, but, you, but, but we have to kind of address this idea of where these desires come from. Right? Where, where, where are these desires, where do they originate? And, and our answer kind of floats all over the place, and we're kind of afraid to answer it. Because on the one hand, if we say that they're just part of us, then we, we have to ask, well, didn't God create us, though? Did he, did he create us and then not create our desire, not give us these desires, right? So there's that. But the other part of this is that if we say that God created our desires— then is God willingly pushing us into destructive decisions? So there's this tension here, right? It's the, it's the question we all go to. That's why verse 18 is so important. It was for his good pleasure to give birth to you through the word of truth. The package of you, all of that, was created by God. God understands those desires. He absolutely understands them. But he did not create those desires in you so you can fall. He created those desires in you so you can understand the need for moral margin. That by his grace and his power, you can create distance between you and temptation. 
you are well aware of those desires. They don't sneak up on you. You don't wake up one day and think, oh, I think I want to do this today. You know exactly who you are. You have an incredible amount of self-awareness because you're created in the image of God. You, you have, you're the one that wrote the book on you. You know it. Which is why Paul can write with authority in Ephesians 5 that there should, in fact, let me just read this. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 3. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. That's an amazing passage by Paul, that the way that we create moral margin is we determine, you know, we, we, we know that we cannot even entertain a hint of deviant behavior, not just sexual immorality, but also greed. Can you imagine that? I think it's okay to be ambitious, but to be greedy, exploiting other people for your personal gain, this is serious business. So when we go back to James and we, we see James teaching here that we have these evil desires, these are a part of our package because even in our failure, Because if we read James by itself, and if we read Paul by itself, we absolutely divorce ourselves from the idea that that we can sin. What happens if we sin? Our our more um, fundamentalist upbringing may say that if you you are tempted and you give way to this temptation, the, the truth, there are some consequences. And there are some awful consequences. Don't get me wrong. This is not a conversation that gives you the license to to sin and and exploit people for your own personal gain. That's not that's not what the scripture teaches. And that's not what I'm telling you. What I am saying is that these desires are built into the system as a way to say now you understand the need for Jesus. See, without those evil desires, we would never understand the need for Jesus in our life. In fact, without those evil desires, there would be no necessity of Jesus. You could scratch all of humanity. You could scratch the word. You could could take scripture out of your life because the only way that we can understand the capacity and the need and the love of Jesus, as Paul says in, in Galatians 2, is that our own is by is because of our own evil desires. They're not created in us to tempt us. They're created in us to show us that we need Jesus. And once we understand that, once we follow Jesus by the power of his spirit and his presence in our lives, we can then divorce ourselves from these temptations, not even a hint of these things, because we're no longer serving ourselves, but we are following Jesus. There's a need for moral margin in our lives. I want to encourage you to follow Jesus here, right? We don't talk about that a lot, but I want to encourage you to give your life to Jesus, to to walk with him, to be buried with him in baptism, to understand the power and the necessity of the Spirit in our lives, of the presence of God as we walk and as we live, as we have conversations, as we work, that God is with us. The word for spirit is also the same word for air. We are breathing the air of God when we follow Jesus and accept his Spirit in our lives. And so you and I can absolutely create distance. We can have margin between us and temptation in spite of in spite of the desires that are built into us that say otherwise. Let's go back to James chapter 1 verse 12 and let's wrap this up. Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial. You can do that because of Jesus. Because when you've stood the test you will receive the crown of life 
that God has promised to those who love him. That's a fantastic promise, and it's a sure promise just for you. Thanks for joining me here on The Conversation. We begin a new teaching series next week called Magnetic. Magnetic. And we're going to actually use... Psalm 23 is our outline as we walk through this. So new teaching series next week here on The Conversation. It's called Magnetic. Thank you so much for joining me here. I hope that you have a blessed day, and I'll see you back here again next Sunday.